Coming up, it's part two of my conversation with System76 principal engineer, Jeremy Soller. We're going to talk about VR gaming, System76's competition, and then we're going to dig really, really deep on firmware and talk about why firmware needs a lot more attention than it's getting right now. Plus, a quick and easy discovery of the week for you Proton gamers out there. And I'm going to talk about a new rabbit hole I'm going down. Spoiler, servers. And somewhere in the mix, we're going to need to chat about what is already the infamous Audacity pull request number 835. An absolutely enormous episode of Linux for Everyone starts right now, and it's made possible by Tuxedo Computers. Thanks, you guys. Hallo zusammen. Ich bin Andreas und ich höre Linux for Everyone in Deutschland. Willkommen daheim. Welcome home. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Linux for Everyone and welcome home. My name's Jason and I am your Padawan in this uh, adventure through desktop Linux open source software and the community creating and enjoying it. Right off the bat, uh, two things. Uh, Number one, I want to thank you guys for thank everybody who took the time to send an email or a message about episode 46. And uh, the sentiment was basically welcome back. It's great to have the show in in my ears again. Um, so thank you for that. It's been uh, it's been a pleasure producing this show again. And uh, what's nice is that I have a bit of a running start now, uh, a bit of a head start, I should say. Well, yeah, a running start too. So I have the uh, the second part of my chat with Jeremy for you today, and then uh, coming up in the next several weeks, I have an interview with the team at shells.com. An interview with the legendary Brian Fox, creator of Bash. Yes, that Bash that you probably used earlier today. Um, And a lot more. And it's already all recorded. And I'm super excited about that. So I'm trying to stockpile some content and um, ensure that there are no more weekly absences for the show. Now, the second thing falls on a more serious note. Uh, Last week in part one of my interview with System76 engineer Jeremy Soller, uh, he made a very brief but derogatory comment regarding Ubuntu's revenue streams and data collection. And he wanted to apologize for that, and he asked me to read the following clarification. This is in Jeremy's words. I had wrongly assumed that Ubuntu desktop was in part funded by analytics data. This is not the case. Ubuntu has been a very important project for me for most of my life, enabling much of my career. I hope this false claim did not hurt a project I love. End quote. And you know what? I think we'll just leave it at that, honestly. Uh, Jeremy made an assumption, and he realized his error, and uh, he actually corrected himself and apologized on Twitter, and then uh, sent me this statement to read to you guys. And hey, you know, I I share some of the blame as well. I should have challenged that assumption that Jeremy made when he made it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, I'm not making excuses, but sometimes it's difficult because either I'm uh, distracted by, you know, the conversation taking branching paths, or we go off on tangents. And uh, sometimes you'll get like that little light bulb that goes off in your head. Hey, you need to make a mental note to... Uh, circle back and ask about this, but I didn't do that. So uh, I apologize as well. And I kind of lied. There's going to be three things that I want to address at the top of the show before we get into the meat of the content here. Uh, And that third thing is episode 50, which is coming up in a few weeks, will be an AMA. I want to give you guys an opportunity to ask me anything, and it doesn't. It definitely doesn't have to be about Linux or even technology. Um, back in episode 17, when I did the first AMA, I actually spent about 10 minutes towards the, uh, the back half of the show answering why I ended up moving from America to Croatia. So 
nothing is off limits per se. Uh, it doesn't mean I have to answer everything or that I will be able to answer everything. I, you know, we'll try to keep it probably 45 minutes or less. Um, but get your question into me. The email address is Linux for everyone at pm.me. That's Linux for everyone at pm.me. And you're going to get bonus points with me if you submit your form in your question. Yeah, You'll get bonus points from me if you submit your question in the form of audio. Episode 47's Discovery of the Week is a quick and easy one, but it's also a really special one to me because it was created by A.U. Nasif. That's how you'll find him on GitHub, A.U. Nasif. Uh, so he's created a utility called Proton Up. But who is this guy? Well, he's the one responsible for all of those amazing thumbnails that you see on our videos. And he is currently designing the new Linux for Everyone website from scratch. And it looks beautiful. And I cannot wait to show you guys what he's been up to. Um, so if you're listening, dude, and I know you are, you rock and you're talented and I really appreciate uh, everything that you do for this show and this entire network and this community. Now, let's get to what he has created. It's called Proton Up. It is a very simple but very effective CLI program that automates the installation of Glorious Egg Rolls Proton GE. Now, a very, very quick overview of what Proton GE is. Uh, it's I would describe it as kind of an enhanced version of Proton, which is the, let, let's call it a compatibility layer that lives in Steam for Linux. And this allows you to, uh, and, and by the way, it's co-developed by Valve and Code Weavers, the creators of Wine. And what this allows you to do is basically a uh, very, very easily install and play Windows-only games on Linux. So it's Proton that uh, that has made possible all of those headlines you see, you know, saying ah, there's 7,000, 9,000, 12,000 games that you can play on Linux now that weren't, you know, wasn't possible before. Uh, you can thank Proton for that. Now, where Glorious Egg Roll's version of Proton comes into play. You know what? I'm just going to read you. Uh, I, I This came across my inbox only about an hour ago, so the timing is excellent. Uh, he sent me a, a questionnaire, some questionnaire responses that he had done for Boiling Steam. So I'm going to read you, um, in his own words, what made him create Proton GE. This is what he says. I really liked playing Warframe, and at the time, Warframe's launcher was terribly broken in wine. So I created a workaround script that manually downloaded and installed and updated the game. Next thing I know, DXVK came out, and I got involved with reporting bugs for it, since Warframe's OpenGL rendering was also terribly broken in wine. Then, Warframe dropped 32-bit support, and the 64-bit version's audio caused constant crashes in Wine, and F-Audio came along, so once again, I began reporting bugs for Warframe to the F-Audio developer. Uh, finally, Proton comes along and added all these things I'd already been working on into one convenient, cross-platform, portable distribution, and I was able to drop my hobbling of scripts and Wine patches for Warframe in favor of Proton. Warframe still needed patches from staging, and around that same time, the original staging developers had quit, so I started working on rebasing staging. Soon, I found out Alistair and ZF were both also doing the same thing, so I reached out to them, got all of us in a group, and that's how I ended up becoming a staging maintainer. Although I mainly do testing and bug reporting, those two really do all the heavy lifting." And uh, and so what Proton GE is, it's it seems like in my view, it's a very rapidly developed fork of Proton. So uh, a brand new version of Proton GE just released yesterday, and it enables stuff like Resident Evil Village to work, and Forza Horizon Four now works. Near Replicant now works. Uh, there's issues that are fixed with Borderlands 2 not launching, an issue with Borderlands 3 that got fixed, and a whole just a laundry list of updates and fixes and changes. And uh, so Proton GE is where you go if you want to maybe eke out a little bit more performance out of a game or 
if you're having trouble getting a game to run, then Proton GE might have that solution baked in. And so this brings us all back to AU Nassif, who has created a simple, brilliant command line utility that automatically installs and updates this variant of Proton. All you really have to do is create a folder within your Steam folder, if it doesn't already exist, and then run a one-line command to install it, and then run Proton up. And uh, it will either auto-install Proton GE, or it will update Proton GE. And there's some options there in the mix as well, uh, some switches that you can play with. But uh, the instructions are very straightforward, and the program itself is very straightforward. So I would invite all the gamers listening to uh, take it for a test drive and let me know what you think, and let him know what you think as well. Uh, I'll have a link to Proton Up in the show notes for this episode, which is episode 47, over at www.com. Linux, the number four, everyone.com. We live in a world now where telemetry is a four letter word. It's a dirty word. It's evil. It's disgraceful. It's invasive. Our privacy has been so abused by corporations. We've seen every scrap of online behavior sold to companies who then in turn try to sell it back to us in the form of targeted ads. We've traded our personal data for convenience, and holy crap, do we regret that. And now it's it's gotten to the point where we're so pissed off and paranoid at what has become of our anonymity and our privacy that we can't tell the difference between very simple anonymous usage data that's meant to help developers like uh, your browser version or what effect you're using in an audio program. And, you know, we can't tell the difference between that and something super invasive like uh, our keystrokes getting captured and sent back to Microsoft or uh, our voice commands or our conversations being sent back to companies like Amazon for, uh, for evaluation and improvement We see the word telemetry and we just run for the hills. Which is probably why 3,420 people have downvoted pull request number 835 for the open source audio software called Audacity. Uh, Guys, I have used Audacity since 2004 when I was uh, doing the Insomnia Radio podcast. Then I used it for the Tangled Cables podcast, and then I used it for the Games Are Evil show, and then I used it to record and produce Presence, a VR podcast, and then I used it to record Linux for everyone, and I've used it on Windows and Linux and Mac OS, and it has always been there for me, and mostly, 99% of the time, been reliable. But you know what? There's that 1% of the time where I have to ask myself, if the developers of Audacity had some anonymous analytics data from me, could that prevent a crash in the future? What if they saw that, you know, for, for literally hundreds of recordings, I have done a very specific workflow uh, with regards to noise reduction. You know, what if they, uh, I don't know, they could see how long I was using Audacity and what those errors were and what OS it was on and what hardware I had. You know, could they make a better product? The answer is absolutely they could make a better product. So pull request 835 gets created and it says, this request provides basic telemetry for Audacity. And this, I think, is when people started to freak out. Universal Google Analytics is used to track the following events. Session start and end. Errors, including errors from the SQ Light 3 engine. Uh, usage of effects, sound generators, analysis tools, so that we can prioritize future improvements. Usage of file formats for importing and exporting OS and Audacity versions. And I, I really think that you combine... 
uh, Google Analytics with the word telemetry in the first two sentences of, of a pull request, and you're going to have people freaking out without even reading the details. And this thing was downvoted so many times and drew, uh, <laughs> drew a lot of hate, really, towards the Audacity developers. In my mind, completely unfounded hate. Things apparently got so bad that they had to uh, issue an update to the pull request where this is this is what they say in the beginning. Dear all, due to the large amount of worry about this PR, which we completely understand, we want to clarify exactly what is going on. Telemetry is strictly optional and disabled by default. No data is shared unless you choose to opt in and enable telemetry. Okay, so to be fair, uh, perhaps the developer should have put that in bold underline print in the original pull request description. Uh, but they also shared a screenshot of what the analytics and crash logging screen might look like. And um, it's it's actually really nice. It says, you know, that we will capture uh, this amount of data. And it's basically, we're not collecting any personal data or sensitive information. We're not collecting your location or your file names, or any content at all of your audio. And personally, I think it's okay. It's perfectly fine, guys. We need to understand that this is a free product. This doesn't cost us anything. It hasn't cost us anything for the last 20 years, I think. It's 20 or 21 years is how long Audacity has been around. It's open source. If you don't trust it, you can pick apart the code. Or you can, you know, if you don't know how to pick apart the code, you can ask the community to help you analyze the code and ensure that there's nothing nefarious happening here. I don't, I don't personally know why they went with Google Analytics, and I think maybe, maybe that's part of that disconnect. Maybe that's part of the animosity. Right? Is there are open source alternatives to Google Analytics, and uh, I think that the community feels maybe pairing something Google and something free and open source uh, doesn't doesn't quite mix it well. And uh, I totally get that. I totally get that. And uh, I'm with you on that. But really, like the amount of I, it just it, it just pains me so much when the community freaks out over stuff like this as if, you know, <laughs> I, I, look, OK, I have used Audacity for the better part of the last 16 years. It's a wonderful piece of software. And if I can, if I can anonymously submit uh, some of the elements of my usage to the developer so that they can make it even better while still keeping it free, have it. Go for it. Absolutely. You're not collecting my location. You don't want my phone number. You're not tracking me across apps. Uh, You're not even touching anything that I'm recording. You're not even looking at my file names. There's really nothing invasive here at all. It is only to benefit the product. At the same time, you know, like I said in the beginning of this segment, I completely empathize with people who feel like enough is enough. You know, all the data breaches and the and the privacy invasions and uh, so much abuse of our data, basically. You know, I completely get where they're coming from. But I think the bottom line, guys, is we have to read the details and we have to understand that giving certain data to the developers of this software is likely to benefit the software and benefit us in the process. Does that mean that we should have blind faith in the developers and just trust that they will do what they say they're going to do? No. But at the same time, maybe we cannot be so quick to organize these lynch mobs against FOSS developers. And now, part two of my discussion with System76 Principal Engineer and Linux Ninja, Jeremy Soller. I have a question from Zima. 
Mm-hmm. And Zima asks, are you a gamer? And I don't even know this. Are you a gamer? And if so, what genres are you into? Oh, boy. I am painfully so. Extremely oh, so. Okay. Uh, to the point where it, you know, we talked about, probably we talked about me wanting to use Linux for everything. This is the place where it breaks down, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> I do I do use Windows quite a bit, uh, mainly for VR. So I have oh, a pretty I have a pretty yeah. intense gaming setup. What's your okay? Tell me about your VR setup. Or so your right setup now, in start with a computer. The computer is the Thaleo Mira, of course. Beautiful. I don't have the production chassis right now, so it's kind of like it's kind of like uh, it's still outside of a proper chassis. <laughs> so I, I was, cause I was working on developing it, uh, developing firmware for it and making sure the support works and also developing the AMD GPU drivers. Uh, Thaleo Mira, basically max configuration, 128 gigabytes of ECC RAM. It Good has Lord. the 5950X. I've overclocked the 5950X significantly. Uh, I have the NHD 15 not to a cooler. So that, Thing does 200 watts. It can do 4.7 gigahertz all core. Then I have the 6800 6, XT. I have a PCIe Gen 4 drive. So I got I gotta say, going to other computers is just painful. <laughs> Pure disappointment. Really, probably. really painful. Uh, even the I have an Epic server in the basement, and it is completely like it is ridiculous. It's for it's for Pop OS builds. Uh, okay. it's nuts how it, it has two 64 core CPUs and it, uh, it probably draws like a thousand Watts just with those CPUs. It has maybe 256 gigs of, of ECC DDR4 RAM and it has two M.2 SSDs. But I gotta say the 5950X just feels so much faster because the single thread performance just knocks everything out of the water. And once you overclock it... It really does. I, I have a 3900X, mm-hmm. and the difference is it is notable. Staggering. Yeah. Yeah, the Zen 2... Zen 2 was a nice upgrade, but Zen 2 was an upgrade to Zen 1, like the 10900K was an upgrade to the 9900K. Just a little bit. Zen 3 was like, blow everything out of the water. So that's that's the computer. It's it's important to mention here that um, you guys do also offer Windows drivers for the Thaleo as well as your laptops. Yes. So uh, for Thaleo, you need to contact support. We're still working on the fan fan management piece for Windows, mm-hmm. uh, but that should be something we accomplish pretty soon here, and that will bring much better fan curves to Windows users on Thaleo. For laptops, all of that stuff is on GitHub for each open open firmware model. For the proprietary firmware models, you have to contact support. We've been building with each new model. We've been trying to build up the support we offer for it. So open firmware was really difficult to get working on Windows, actually, especially the ones with NVIDIA cards. Since we did all that work to get it working on Windows, we kind of want to make sure people understand, like, this is a core boot laptop, but it will boot Windows 10, and it will actually do better in Windows 10 than the proprietary firmware did for that same laptop. So we will outperform the ODM's firmware, both in Linux and in Windows. Uh, and I think that's very, very important to understand. Usually it's a company develops a laptop that works with Windows and then has to do a bunch of fixes to make it work with Linux, or Linux has to apply those fixes. For us, it was the other way around, where we had to figure out what is Windows doing, and 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 figure out what the firmware would do to make that work properly. And eventually, we got there with with the open firmware laptops. So, I am especially proud of the Orx Pro and the way it runs on on Windows. Yeah, the drivers are all on GitHub. They're not open source though. A lot of it comes from Intel or from Nvidia. So. Hopefully, in the future, whenever Windows decides to go open source, <laughs> uh, they actually they forced a bunch of driver companies to release their driver UIs on the Windows Store. Even though the drivers have to be installed through a third-party website, it will automatically download the utility, like the AMD Radeon utility, whatever that's called, 
Adrenaline. Adrenaline, yeah. Yeah, adrenaline. it will download that through the Windows Store, or it will download the NVIDIA control panel. It makes it really funky to do drivers on Windows, but they're trying to force everybody they can to use the Windows Store in all kinds no. of funky ways. No, no. I remember installing Flight Simulator through the Windows Store, and it did not work <laughs> at all. Steam. It only had like Steam two all the gigabytes. Way. Well, this was before, so people were able to grab yeah. it like like 12 hours early because they changed their, their time on their computer and the Windows Store let you grab it, but the Steam Store wasn't going to launch until 12, you know, midnight, a specific time zone. So I tried it and it tried to download two gigabytes, which of course then you have to get into the Microsoft Flight Simulator UI and then it doesn't install for like four hours, even if you're on gigabit Ethernet. Oh, I know. Um, it, it took overnight for me. Really fantastic game. Really, really, really terrible, terrible installer and updater. I'm not even going to pull any punches. I completely, I mean, and this is well before I got into Linux. I gave up on the Windows Store because mm-hmm. I have three separate stories of <laughs> trying to install various versions of Gears of War or Forza. Oh. God. Through, through the Windows Store. And I'm talking about trying mm-hmm. on multiple systems, fresh installs, reinstalls, like troubleshooting with yeah. Microsoft support. So many, I mean, exhausting all of my options for They still weeks. haven't figured it out. And I still could not get these games installed. I remember playing the Halo Master Chief collection. And that, I, I think they figured it out and finally decided, well, we'll release these on Steam and we'll do the the updater inside the app, and that actually uses the Steam DLC uh, system to download the games. So it didn't have any issues. But all the stuff going through, like even the Steam install of the Microsoft Flight Simulator, still uses the same path and same yeah. kind of code to download <laughs> data through the window through the Microsoft Store. So I think, yeah, it's it's a pain. I I don't get it at all. But I do I do a lot of gaming. I do VR. I have an HP Reverb, which unfortunately oh. is only Windows Windows yeah. uh, mixed reality. But I could not give up on that resolution. So I'm hoping maybe the Valve Index Two or whatever will have a bumped up resolution um, because I've tried different headsets and it really did not feel right. Anything except the HP Reverb about a year ago when I bought it. That was the only one that felt right. Not many people know this, but about, I don't even know, five years ago, five, six years ago, uh, I worked at Upload VR for a while. I did a podcast really? for them called Presence. Hello, and welcome back to a new episode of Presence, a podcast about virtual reality and the people creating it. I'm your host, Joseph Noop, and with me, as always, is the VR evangelist, my favorite evangelist, Jason Evangelo. Jason, hey. how are you? I'm, I'm fantastic. And uh, did, some, did some writing as well. Like I traveled over to uh, Insomniac and covered some of the games that they were doing for the Rift. Cool. Man, I was, I was bullish about VR back then. I thought for sure it is only a matter of months before this explodes. This yeah. is so exciting and so fresh. And uh, <laughs> yes, it's expensive. You know, uh-huh. it's very expensive. Uh, but now, you know, casually tracking the the news feeds surrounding VR, it, it just seems like it's stagnant. Is that just yes, my perception yeah. being outside of the bubble now? Or is no. that... In the past four years or however long since you've done that, like you look on Steam and you look, well, show me the most popular VR games. They're all released in 2018 or 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 earlier. Or it's Half-Life Alex. Or it's Half-Life Alex. So (laughs) uh, I think Boneworks came out in 2019, but that's that's about it. So definitely game releases stagnant, definitely aren't that many. Hmm. But the games that are released get regular updates and those updates can be can be quite amazing, like uh, Blade and Sorcery or or Hot Dogs, Horseshoes, and Hand Grenades. They get updates all the time. They have mods. Um, <laughs> that game's great. Yeah, so if you if you if you get a few of those and they're only like five bucks a piece, and you mod them to hell, you can have quite a good time. Uh, where I think I'll be playing those games and 
for the next five years probably. And then Microsoft Flight Simulator, uh, after they fixed oh. some performance issues, I was in the beta for that VR, uh, the the VR beta, mm-hmm. and the performance was just terrible. I had a 3090 at the time. Um, I'm usually swapping through graphics cards just nowadays because we're all spread out uh, for testing. So I had a 3090, and then I had a 3080, and then I had a 3070 working my way down, and then... <laughs> I had a 6700 XT, and now I have a 6800 XT. Next, I'll have a 6900 XT. So kind of down one side, up the other. Um, VR worked on all of them. Uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator has significant performance issues until recently, but now it's a really incredible title. So I think it's just you're probably not going to get very many, maybe one or two really good titles a year compared to like a dozen good titles for non-VR gaming. I guess so, and I thought for sure that once uh, once PlayStation embraced it, that it would, you know, yeah. uh, infiltrate the public consciousness a little bit more. But it, I don't think it did that either. I think it I was don't just know a, very many. PSVR you know, the VR PlayStation users, VR was so. like the the Sega 32X or something. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 comparing it to other headsets, uh, it was worse than basically every PC headset. But yeah, I, I think it's something that's definitely going to grow as the cost comes down. But until you get down to the cost of like maybe 150 for a headset and maybe it has integrated hand tracking and it's inside out tracking. So all you need is the headset until you get to that point And the Oculus Quest is really getting pretty close. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I think it's going to be pretty troublesome. VR is not going to grow. And when it does grow, it's going to grow based on the price that people are buying into it. If they're buying headsets that are 150 bucks, you're going to expect games that pair with headsets that are 150 bucks. Things that just aren't which is to say aren't half like, like Alex. It's not going right. to be half like Alex. Uh, we'll yeah, be lucky be to little... see another thing like that um, in the next few years. Ah, so frustrating. I yeah. haven't played Half Life Alex just because I don't have. I don't have my uh, VR gear anymore. But. You really should. All right, Jeremy. <laughs> Mark wants to hear an update on the in-house produced laptops that you guys teased last year. And in fact, I think you mm-hmm. actually teased them in 2019 at Superfan 3. That is correct. Is there anything you can tell us? No, we cannot okay. tell you anything. <laughs> um, Dang it. <laughs> well, Mark, yeah, these, I asked. Uh, when this happens, it is going to be complete silence. And then big release, especially considering the way that the motherboard supply chain works for these things. So don't expect very much from us. We are taking note and we are watching what people want and we're doing surveys and Mm -hmm. we are designing, but I don't think we'll be showing off pre-production things. Even with the launch keyboard, we didn't show off pre-production things. We had a production design that hadn't been scaled for manufacturing yet. So we knew that this was what it was going to look like. We just hadn't gotten to the scale where we're going to start selling it. So teasers will happen when it's a lot closer to release. You don't build a laptop from scratch in a couple years. You especially don't build it when you have serious restrictions on on our manufacturing right now. So yeah, our manufacturing well, okay. space, me... we used to share, you, you've you been there, we used to share office space there, so every yeah. single employee of the company would go there. Now the manufacturing is spread out significantly uh, so that there's distancing between everybody. Everyone's huh. wearing masks, and um, yeah. we have not had any cases originate from inside the warehouse, which is good. Good. Um, but the uh, yeah, the manufacturing facility is filled already. So uh, <laughs> it's been really tough to do anything beyond simple picking of of components and design of of things that we're not sure are going to be manufacturable yet, because we need to have access to more manufacturing. Hopefully, we we will be acquiring more space soon. Uh, I know a oh, significant cool. part of our company is already vaccinated, so. It won't be long until we have a little more bandwidth and whatever timeline we promised in 2019 has definitely been extended. I'm uh, not sure that you, uh, I don't remember a, a, a 
specific. I'm sure I probably promise. said tomorrow back then. I I don't think you did, Jeremy. I think that I think that. Well, <laughs> I know that I heard Carl say several years. Realistic. Several years. Well, now it is several almost years. several years, right? Yes. Okay. Let me twist this question. Let me let me turn this question mm-hmm. on its head just a little bit to give Mark maybe some satisfaction. Okay. What is what would your dream laptop look like? And I will. I will say this for you that this does not this does not necessarily represent System Seventy Six's future plans for their own laptop. Uh, Lemur Pro, obviously. Really? Yeah, already. Yeah, that's your dream is. laptop. That's my dream laptop. But there's huh. something you got to realize. I'm not really a. We have Bonobo customers, right? And we have people that are okay with lugging around a 17 pound laptop mm-hmm. uh, with two <laughs> charging bricks. <laughs> and we have Lemur Pro customers, and sometimes they're the same people. Certainly, there's overlap. The thing I like about laptops is their battery life, and the Lemur Pro meets all of my needs. The thing yes, I like is... about computers has to come from a desktop. I do 99% of my work on desktops. The rare occasion I'm on a laptop is to develop firmware uh, where it is something that I just have to see right there. I usually have laptops next to my com- my keyboard, like one on each side uh, in development, but I'm going to be writing the firmware on the desktop and then flashing it on the laptop. The amount of time I spend on laptops, I just don't like it at all. I don't like hmm. having a computer system uh, that you have to lug around. So the things I would want to see added to it I would want to see uh, more configurability, Mm -hmm. where especially where we don't have any soldered RAM. I would like to see an even bigger battery. I would like to see the keyboard redesigned. And launch is one of the things carrying us in that direction. I would like to see the webcam be at least 1080p. Please, for the love of God, it's 2021. The screen ought to be at least 4K. So... I think that covers it. Like, I want an OLED 4K screen in a 14-inch laptop. Is that nuts? Probably. (laughs) I think Alienware Uh, has that. And if we have to cut out the damn speakers to make the battery bigger, I would do it. (laughs) I I am never in a place where I want to use laptop speakers. I'm either in public with a laptop, and I don't want you to hear what the hell I'm doing, or I'm at my house. And so if I'm at my house, I want to use, you know, better speakers. Even then, I think headphones have in a lot of cases, have better audio audio quality than speakers. That may be crazy for people to hear, but when you have the huge over-ear headphones, there's things that that make me a lot different from our average customer. Our average customer, we already know that. They're buying a 15-inch. They're getting 32 gigs of RAM. Mm -hmm. They're going, half of them are going the Intel route. Half of them are going the, the NVIDIA route. And if we had supply of AMD CPUs, I think... It would split off quite a bit of that, would go to AMD uh, CPUs like the Pangolin. And we know that they love the big battery in the lemur and the battery life of it. We know the things that they dislike about the lemur are things that we are planning to fix. Maybe we'll improve the keyboard layout. Maybe we'll make it a little more configurable. Maybe we'll have better components like like the screen and the a bigger touchpad and, and a better camera. Nice. But also we don't... I think we plan to introduce our new laptop line alongside the current laptop line where we replace one model at a time. So we may replace the 15-inch model that sells the best with an in-house design. We'll still have the 17-inch Oryx and the 14-inch Lemur or something like that. Uh, We're going to phase it in. As our manufacturing capacity grows and as we get a little more confident with it, the same way we did open firmware on on these models. And unlike Thaleo, where we were were able to introduce Thaleo all at once, we have a lot more volume of laptops. It would be really hard to introduce all of them at once because the designs are so drastically different between them. You have different component choices on the inside. And for Thaleo... We try to utilize the same components as much as possible. So we designed the first model that w- was really small for what it fits, the, the first Thaleo. 
Um, the model code is Thaleo B1. And then because we had already designed to fit that model, we were able to scale that up to the Thaleo Major and scale that up to Thaleo Massive and then introduce the AMD variants and then um, introduce the Mega in between the Major and Massive and so on and so forth. We were able to build that line out um, because Thaleo was selling so well, it really carried everything else and we didn't have to worry Whereas with laptops, we have a really significant split between sizes where there are people who really want a 14-inch and really don't want a 17-inch, and there's people who feel the opposite way about it. So I, I hope that explains it a little more, how it the does, rollout's yeah. going to be. Uh, for desktops, the size is not so much important as what it fits, and the Thaleo that we launched first could fit 2080 Ti's when, when we launched it, I think. And it could fit a pretty fast CPU, and it fit in a very small footprint, so it was able to fill the gaps very easily. Laptops, it's going to be a lot harder to to do that. Since we've been chatting about the the Thaleo a little bit, uh, Luke Jensen asked Mm -hmm. if you have any estimates on when Core Boot will be available for Thaleo. Uh, He says, so far, it's only been available on laptops, but I'm in the market for a desktop within the next few months, and the idea of open source firmware intrigues me. Thaleo and Core Boot will not happen in the next few months. So if you want to have Thaleo, uh, do not wait for Core Boot. And there's a few reasons for this. The supply chain on laptops, like I mentioned before, is very specific. So we have a much stronger direct relationship with the motherboard provider for our current laptop line. And we are able to get schematics. We're able to get documentation, data sheets about every single chip on the motherboard. And that allows us to develop firmware for it, uh, both the uh, core boot firmware and the EC firmware, without any decrease in the time to market. So now it's actually faster for us to develop a laptop model using our open source firmware because there's just so much baked Mm -hmm. in and we read through the schematic and develop a new model and port it we don't reference the proprietary firmware at all anymore. We reference the schematic the same way that they would develop the, the proprietary firmware uh, for a laptop motherboard. So now it's actually faster for us. We don't have to go back to the ODM to request, make this change in firmware or this change. We do it ourselves and we do it a lot faster. That's why laptops have been so easy to port Core Boot to. The difficulty mm-hmm. comes when you have things like Ryzen where... Uh, there is no upstream support in Core Boot for these processors. So there's a significant amount of work left to be done by AMD and by by other hardware vendors to ensure that AMD products can be supported by Core Boot. Uh, this same kind of issue applies to our desktops, along with the supply chain issue. Huh. The supply chain for desktop motherboards is such that we do not have enough volume to be able to have a specialized motherboard. And for that reason, we are directly working with a distributor to purchase what would otherwise be off-the-shelf motherboards. We do contact the the manufacturers of those motherboards, Asus and Gigabyte. We do get customized firmware, and we do get documentation about some features, but they have, as of yet, been unwilling to release uh, the necessary schematics to develop core boot safely. Ah, I and see. Uh, it is possible to port a motherboard without the schematics, but it is incredibly dangerous uh, to the point where we could be setting ourselves up to have out of box failures or failures some short time after the product is is received by a customer. And you should be really weary of companies that develop core boot without the proper documentation, of which I'm aware of a few. Uh, I won't mention them now, but if you look through my Twitter feed, you might find some hints. Then going forward, we do hope to, after we develop laptops in-house, perhaps there is some room for us to start developing desktops in-house, desktop motherboards. Being able to develop the chassis has done a tremendous amount for us, to the point where we control so much of the system uh, that it is unlikely to have much benefit to us outside of openness to develop open source (laughs) firmware. So I think I I pretty much summed it up. 
Uh, desktop ODMs are very different. You have to buy either at tremendous quantities, uh, which are unusual for desktop motherboards, or you you have to uh, reverse engineer things that are that are difficult to reverse engineer. Okay, well that was a substantial solid answer. Okay, so uh, over on Patreon, Justin said that he has a Lemur Pro on the way right now, and he's always been interested in Core Boot, um, and he's wondering if System76 is okay with community firmware development, or if or if you guys would like to kind of have more control over the process. Uh, we have a number of people who develop firmware changes on behalf of us, and, and we integrate those and we release those if they're, if they're useful to all users. So yeah, it, there's definitely a community effort, and I think if we discuss more about how software and firmware could become more like each other... How uh, can this they? Is one where, well, <laughs> but, firmware I mean, is let's... just software. And when you really look at it, the firmware is running on a chip that has the same kind of read-write cycle tolerance as a, as a typical SSD. So, let's start, let's, I'll tell you what, let, let's start from a really high level, if you don't mind. What is the core benefit of Core Boot? The primary benefit of Core Boot, if it's ported... By the vendor, I don't believe very much in third-party ports, especially with in the lack of uh, proper data like schematics. But if it is properly created and, and tested by the hardware vendor, like a System76 laptop, you will be able to see how the, core, how, how the firmware initializes the machine. You'll be able to modify that behavior, and you'll be able to switch out the payload, which is what it's called, on these machines. So Core Boot is kind of like a bootloader for firmware. Core Boot does uh, memory initialization and does a, a few driver initializations, but then it jumps to a payload that's also stored on the same ROM chip. And for us, that default payload is, is UEFI, which is mm. from the EDK2 project. We have our custom version of that that we build in, in the same open source repository that we keep Core Boot. We build them together and package them together as the firmware that's guaranteed to work on the machine. You are free to modify that any way you want. I think that's the biggest advantage. There are other advantages like reduced surface attack, uh, reduced le- number of drivers that run inside of the, the firmware. For example, you open up the boot menu on our system, you're not going to find a lot of switches because we expect those switches to be done by the operating system. Uh, we have uh-huh. reduced the amount of surface area in our firmware, and in doing so, we've also increased the, the boot speed, and we've also increased the resume from suspend speed, such that very few laptops uh, have similar resume from suspend speeds. Uh, I, I was not impressed by the Apple M1 demonstration where he dragged the lid open and it turned the screen on immediately because that is something that I already expected uh, <laughs> using the core boot firmware. So this also has to be tied into our open embed controller firmware. Yes. Uh, that does actually weigh more for the user at runtime. Core boot gets the system initialized. Then the EDK2 payload boots the operating system. But while you're booted into the operating system, a lot of the stuff that's defined on this, on, at a hardware level is defined by the embed controller, whether it be charging the battery or running the fans or doing the keyboard backlight or handling the keyboard at all, uh, the key presses, or the touchpad. All of these things interface with the embed controller. So that was actually a much more tremendous reverse engineering project where I had to write a simulator for the embed controller firmware. It is a pretty intense piece of code that will run the firmware for the embed controller while at the same time running core boot inside of uh, QMU. What? So, and it, they will interface <laughs> together using a socket. So it, it acts as though it were the real laptop. Uh, okay. There are a number of things that I reverse engineered this, the, using this method. We got data sheets for the embed controller. Uh, we reverse engineered a number of things. And now it's at the point where we don't touch the proprietary embed controller firmware anymore. We look at the schematics and we verify the things that are in the schematics match our port to the embed controller. 
We developed things like the fan curve, the sequencing of the LEDs, the keyboard layout, all of the hotkeys, those things all go through the embed controller. So um, I think that's an even more interesting piece where we directly control the way the computer operates when the user is running the operating system. And that in turn, I mean, that in turn gives the user more control, more, more fine tuned control over Absolutely. the system, how they, how they want it to operate as well. They can see and they can see how the fans operate. For example, they can see everything from when the power button is pressed to when the system shuts off after running the operating system. So uh, I think there's a lot of information in there that uh, is really difficult to find. And so much so that now we are, we are working together with Purism. Their new Librem 14 will also be running System76 EC. Is that right? Yes. So we have developed something that is uh, usable across a number of different laptops uh, running certain embed controllers. There is another project called Chrome EC that Chromebooks use, but that targets 32-bit embedded controllers that are really rare. What we're targeting are 8-bit embed controllers that are used across the vast majority of Windows laptops, including Dell laptops, Lenovo laptops, HP laptops. And uh, this opens us up to provide an open source version of what you would normally see on a, on a PC, as opposed to the Chromebook model, which is completely different from, from the mm -hmm. typical PC, where uh, I think the software ecosystem is just very different. We try to target Linux and Windows. We try to target an open market where any operating system that runs on a PC can run on one of our laptops, where we have open sourced pieces that are important for a normal PC, not for a specialized, uh, reduced set of, of functions like Chromebooks, I believe, are. It is pretty difficult to get a Chromebook running a Linux distribution. Interestingly, the person who does the most work on that is working at Purism right now. And so they, they work on Chrome EC, they work on integrating UEFI uh, into the core boot firmware for Chromebooks so that they can boot a real operating system and not Chrome OS, which I do not believe is a, <laughs> a real, real operating, operating system. system. <laughs> Chrome OS is a kiosk. How do you really feel? So uh, anyway, oh, Mac OS man. is going to be that way too. Windows might even become that way. If Yeah, I, I hope that makes it more clear the embedded controller in our systems we try to implement in an open source manner the way pcs currently work we are not trying to implement the vision of companies like google and apple where your pc becomes a sandbox uh, a, sorry a walled garden mm -hmm. uh, that only installs applications from google or apple to me it seems like since you since you guys started introducing and working on core boot or uh, into you know into System seventy six hardware, it seems like it's actually kind of trickling out into the ecosystem now, which is exactly what is so magical about the open source community, in yeah. my opinion. It's it's never it's never just you know we're System seventy six and we're building this thing just for us and just for our benefit. No, we want it's, our competitors to play ball too. We want every single competitor to go this direction. It just makes things better for the consumer. And I've seen, so I've seen Purism go from just offering Core Boot to offering Core Boot Plus System76 EC. I have seen Tuxedo try to port Core Boot to their models. I've seen Star Labs port Core Boot. And uh, I really like the direction this is heading. It means that there are a number of options out there uh, and one clear leader. <laughs> you're, not a con you're not a confident man at all. Um, <laughs> uh, is there anything else that you wanted to, to address on, on that front? You are running an operating system before your computer boots. You really are. There are disk drivers in there. There are graphics drivers in there. All of those have to work. All of those have to be updated for security. And very few people really think about it. When they press the power button, they don't think about an entire operating system bringing up the computer to hand off to another operating system. They think more about, well, this is a, a 
set in stone piece of code that just gets the screen to turn on and then the operating system takes over it is far more complicated than that um but i think i think we should do some rapid fire on these other questions cool okay we'll do that and then and then we can uh we can maybe circle back at a at another time mm-hmm. to do a like a firmware hardcore episode sure all right, Julian D on Patreon asks, "Do you plan on trying different desktop environments for Pop OS?" Not at the moment. We have okay. Cosmic coming soon, and and yeah. you may enjoy it quite a bit. So you you probably hear things from your customers, and I hear things from my audience. Mm-hmm. And um, one of the uh, loudest comments and the most frequent comments is, "I would love Pop OS with KDE." So install KDE. <laughs> I've, d- I've done there it any... before and it runs fine. There are things that are going to be missing. Um, yeah, see, that's the thing. That's, it's not. But it's those not are a pop complete... things, not KDE things. And if KDE wants to get to the point where we implement those things for KDE, there's going to have to be a lot, far more momentum to actually use huh. KDE. Would you guys ever officially, or I don't know about officially, but would you? support um unofficial spins of pop os uh in the same way that maybe fedora has or if you say would we support them well not support from a like not not from a like not a customer support we would provide customer support we provide customer support on pretty much any linux distribution you install so if you want to install arch or manjaro or, or manjaro kde or or kubuntu or whatever or fedora we will provide support on that platform as well. So it okay. is, and that includes Windows as well, uh, which is pretty common among our customers. As for Pop! OS, I think I would be excited to see somebody figure out how to implement the Pop! OS experience on KDE. It just won't be us. So That's uh, fair. The, the That's ISO, fair, but, but at least you guys would be supportive of, of the community doing that. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and I would be happy to help. Sweet. Well, there you go, Julian. An interesting thing, somebody leaked the information about 2104, or at least parts of it, the changes that would be coming to it, by building the ISO for 2104 uh, before we've (laughs) released one. Because it really is like two commands. You get clone the ISO repository, you CD into it, and then type make. And then you get an ISO. Wow, uh, I think that's our, easier than I thought. It's far easier to participate huh. in Pop! OS than other Linux distributions. And this is part of the reason why we've been able to move faster is we have tried to remove the the difficulties of contributing uh, such that the majority of software developers will be familiar with the tools that we use. And most of that is on GitHub and doing pull requests and doing common... Uh, Linux command line things like using git or using make it's uh, I think it is really easy to contribute to pop os awesome well that's encouraging i i hope i i honestly hope that uh months or years down the road we see like the pop os k d e spin or the pop os i three not i don't know if you need an i three spin really but right now I only use the gnome stuff, but before we had pop shell, I was definitely using i three and before we had Pop Shell, we were definitely looking at KDE. And mm. I do have a KDE install on a number of machines. It's pretty easy to retrofit that on top of Pop OS. It's just that when you do that, you're going to get KDE. Uh, just like uh, if you install Fedora, you're going to get GNOME. If you mm-hmm. install Pop OS, you're not really getting GNOME. You're getting GNOME plus some modifications. So none of those changes that we make to GNOME are going to be present in KDE except a few very low-level ones like the newer kernel, new Mesa, and running System76 Power. Tie-ins to the UI, I I really encourage you to try uh, Cosmic when it comes out because it may answer all of your questions. And when does that come out again? We're going to release it for 2104. Sweet. We don't have a set-in-stone release date for 2104. Uh, So it will not be releasing. I don't think it will be releasing the same time Ubuntu releases it. Okay, because you guys don't do like lockstep. You don't do lockstep releases with Ubuntu necessarily. We did very close stepping with Ubuntu where it would be like a couple days. Um, But now I think it could be it could be one to two months. Okay. And this is, you know, 
It's worth waiting for, I'm sure. It is because the majority of the changes that would come to 2104 from Ubuntu are already in 2010. We've already updated the kernel. We've updated Mesa. GNOME, the GNOME stack is not changing. It will still be 3.38. So 2104 without Cosmic would kind of just be bumping the version number. (laughs) So we are going to make sure that we've finished it. The exciting news, though, is perhaps we will have uh, an alpha or beta close to the Ubuntu release. But the but the alpha or beta will will automatically update to the final exactly. release candidate, yeah, right? We, okay, we always nice. make sure that yeah. at this point in time, we've already done upgrades of 2104 from 2004, from 2010. Uh, we've already tested installs. It's to the point where now we're sure this is going to be a release, and it's just finishing the features that we have planned for Cosmic, really. I'm already running 2104 on a number of computers. Don't don't tempt me. I just I finally have like my dream like solid install and I don't want to mess with it. Um, yeah. Okay, Chance would like to know what resources you would recommend for getting started learning about and working on the Linux kernel. It's really important when you're contributing to the Linux kernel to figure out what exactly you want to do because it is a very wide set of code that covers all kinds of things. Maybe you're interested in real-time audio. That is a very, very different thing from implementing drivers. It is a very different thing from file system code. I think you have to be a little more specific to figure out what resources. And then I, I recommend when you find something you're interested in to try to get familiar with the pieces of code in the Linux kernel repository that handle that. If you're interested in graphics, you're going to be looking at the driver's DRM directory or driver's GPU DRM directory. If you find that code, you can find some maintainers for that code, and you can try to reach out to them about how they would approach working on that code. If you ask somebody like me, the majority of the work I'm doing in the Linux kernel, by the time I'm getting to it, usually someone else has already contributed something where it's <laughs> Intel. Intel put in some code that needs to be backported for for Wi-Fi or AMD, for example. They have some GPU code that needs to be changed. These are things they've already done in patches. And my work is to find those patches, figure out how are they able to even boot these devices and make it work in Pop! OS. For our own products, we do have a driver But it's really the only driver. It's the System76 ACPI driver. It's upstream and it handles the interface between the kernel and the open source embedded controller code. Oh. I personally try to minimize the amount of changes we make to the Linux kernel. So when we wrote that driver, we tried to write it in a way that it would be able to handle basically any laptop or desktop we would ever produce. So you probably would not be, uh, for example, implementing the kind of kernel level tweaks uh, for Intel processors that no, I think Solus not unless OS. they were already upstream. So, uh, and we, we've certainly thought about that optimization that Solus does. There's something to realize about that. Uh, the optimization that Solus does has to be packaged together with a whole bunch of different changes. It isn't just that you bring the kernel in from Solus and the patches they have. That will net you maybe 0.1%. You have to bring back the GCC changes that they made. You have to bring in the Python changes they made. You have to bring in changes to all kinds of libraries. And all that fit together to maybe gaining 2% performance in, in some tasks. But it also comes at a cost that is very difficult to stay up to date with Upstream. That there are reasons why Upstream hasn't accepted these changes. And also that... Uh, you will lose hardware support. There will be hardware that is not supported by Clear Clear OS because of all the changes they made in Clear OS. Solus, I'm not really sure compared to Clear OS how much better it, it can do or or worse. But I'm very aware aware of the changes they made in Clear OS. I was very interested in it for a while. Uh, investigating it, it seemed like it would be quite a big project. Hmm. And it would potentially yeah. decrease the hardware support we have. Sounds like the right call. Then. <laughs> there are some there are some things happening upstream to bring in the optimizations. So I know that Red Hat is interested in this kind of optimization where GCC compiles different versions of libraries, and then glibc 
can select the version based on detected processor features and do all this dynamically, which is similar to what ClearOS does, but ClearOS has a minimum optimization. And sometimes the optimizations actually backfire. Not often, but I have seen it happen where you compile with, you tell the processor, well, compile Python with, uh, with AVX enabled. And it does. And some tests perform better, some tests perform worse. So there's a lot of moving elements uh, in trying to get increased performance from optimization like that. All right, Jeremy. Uh, Let's wrap all this up with a bow. And let me ask you this. This is from Oliver. And Mm -hmm. it's something I've been curious about, too. What is the best thing about working at System76? So what is the point of life? (laughs) Uh, Well, uh, (laughs) that might be a different episode. I think you really, if you're going to stay alive, you really need to figure out what you're doing it for. And huh. and what I'm doing it for is to have a cozy, nice life where I can live with my family and do things that I enjoy and maybe retire a little early and, and travel and so on and so forth. System 76 is the only place I could work where I am given the ability to direct the way the company is going. And uh, open source firmware is really something I I hammered on, and I was given the opportunity to work on that and given promotions when it worked. And uh, this is just an environment that I thrive in, where I know that I can do a podcast like this. Yeah. I know that I don't have to worry about what other engineers have to worry about. Uh, is the company gonna gonna sue me for something I say? Am I gonna be fired? <laughs> Uh, you know, I cannot, I cannot talk to somebody at Dell or Lenovo without, without PR people on the, on exactly. the line. Exactly. You'd need lawyers. I, I really enjoy that. I think it's very unique for an engineer to be able to have this kind of exposure. It's refreshing. Yeah. And, uh, I really want to expand that too. So I noticed that there is a profound lack of knowledge, especially at the lower level of how operating systems and firmware and hardware work that the talking heads, and no offense, I'm talking mainly about the guys like Linus Tech Tips, they try to get close to the real answers, and they often fail. So I think that there is a real missing thing in the understanding in our whole entire tech community about how these things work at a lower level, and the majority of that misunderstanding is that there's no one there to try and explain it. Well, what's, what's the biggest misconception? I think the biggest misconception about computers especially is that they are consumables and that you would buy something from Dell and you would throw it away in two years and the firmware doesn't need to change in that time and the operating system doesn't need to change in that time. It's just something you use and then you throw away and then you get a new one. The reality is that these things can live 10 to 20 years if they're treated properly. The only parts that really need to be replaced are the battery and maybe at some point uh, the keyboard or or the touchpad. These are component level changes. Firmware needs to change all the time. If you do not receive firmware updates once a month at the very least. Once a month? Yes. Sometimes, Sometimes we make it to two months or something, but usually it's like once every two weeks we're doing updates to... The operating that's, system and a firmware. That's insane. And and it's very important. Why though? Why why should firmware be updated that that frequently? Because firmware is software. Because software needs to update frequently to cover security holes, and so does firmware. Oh. Because firmware is an entire operating system and one that is less tested than the operating system you run. See, that's that's something that I never thought about until you yeah. mentioned it a few minutes ago. Was like, mm-hmm. there's an operating system before your operating system loads. There's an operating system that runs out of that ROM chip and it can be updated and it must be updated because if it is not updated, it will be vulnerable. It's the same reason that you need to update your operating system. Even more so, you need to update your firmware because firmware is just so less visible. You press the power button, the system turns on, boots the operating system in 10 seconds. That 10 seconds when the firmware was doing anything People care a lot less about vulnerabilities in that 10 seconds than they should. And people care a lot more about the vulnerabilities when the op- once the operating system is loaded. Both are incredibly important. And both require constant updates. 
we provide updates to products that have been in the field for years. And it's a very important part of our ethos is when you buy hardware from us, you own it and you get lifetime support until that thing is completely dead. Like there, the, the component changes would require you to spend more than the cost of the product. I think the same thing applies to vehicles. People don't buy a car every two years and then just throw it in the trash. When you buy a vehicle, <laughs> you keep it. Maybe you keep it 10 years. You sell it to, as a used product. And during that 10 years, you maintain it. You replace the battery. You replace things that fail. You keep that thing running to the point where we see cars that are 20 years old and it is not an odd thing at all. When was the last time you saw a laptop that was 10 years old or 20 uh, years old? I'm 20? <laughs> like I, Never. I, I have, Never. I have Ten, laptops that are near that age. but My oldest laptop right now is a 2012 MacBook Pro, perfectly and, working. And if it breaks at some point... There is a time when it will break and you will not be able to fix it. I think I want to extend that much further. So we're providing the mm. firmware updates that users need for security so that the, the product lifespan is longer, so that we can compete with companies that do one firmware version at release and maybe an update a year. Jeez. And maybe only for a couple years. Uh, people need to pay way more attention to the lower level especially developers. You can say you're a front-end developer, but if you don't really understand or refuse to understand what's happening at a lower level, I really want you to try because it is extremely valuable to understand how computers work and how you get to the point where you can write code in JavaScript that runs on a website. And there are very few firmware engineers that have any pu publicity at all, if, if there are any. Are you Are you trying to step into that role, to a kind of a, kind of like the spokesperson in a sense, right? Yes, and and there are other members in the core boot community that have, but they talk to each other and they stay within their community. There aren't enough interviews like this where somebody will talk about firmware. Usually, it'll be something like, "Oh, well, this this model does this, this model does that, and everything else underneath is magic." <laughs> But don't you want to know how that magic works? I mean, a lot of people yeah, that's uh, the don't, whole... but uh, I think that a lot of Linux users do. At some point, somebody is working on the magic, and the fact that they haven't told you how is just them ensuring they have job security. I've been thinking about this idea for a while. Maybe the next time I port a model, maybe I'll do a live stream where I do the entire port of the entire model uh, completely in the open and public. So you can see exactly what does it take to make a laptop run core boot and our embedded controller firmware and Linux. How long, uh, how long would that live stream be? <laughs> uh, for some laptops, like two hours. I mean, oh, okay. sometimes it's just like, oh, well, we bumped this component. Okay. And I'll pull in some new micro code. And, uh, but usually it takes, it takes about two weeks. All right. Uh, it's uh, but that happens in bursts where like I'll I'll get the firmware ported in one day, and then I'll get the operating system code written in one day, and then the next uh, the next ten days are going to be uh, trying to get those things to work properly and just fixing the bugs in them. It's gotten a lot quicker. The Lemur Pro took like three months uh, because the embedded controller firmware had to be reverse engineered. But now I can do, if the new model is similar to a previous model, I can do updates to a model within one to two weeks. But no, I think you're right. I mean, just this, you know, just this two hour conversation with all the uh, kind of these fascinating nuggets about uh, core boot and firmware and, mm -hmm. you know, how much is actually happening under the hood yeah. has been really enlightening for me. And I feel like we, I know that we have only scratched the surface. Right. I just wish that more people who were involved in this were, uh, were extroverts. I'm definitely not an extrovert, but uh, I don't think I'm an introvert either. So I'm completely comfortable to talk about this stuff for however as long to however many people is required. <laughs> but most firmware engineers and most low-level OS engineers just want to talk to the code. 
Okay, well, you said you're not a conference guy. Once the world no, because, gets back to normal, you might have to become a conference no, no, guy no, no, and no, give no, that no. give that talk. No, 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 no. <laughs> a conference, so I can do a talk, but I have to do all this preparation and, and transport just to talk to 30 people for an hour when no, I, okay. I really want to reach a, a wider audience than that. And I really enjoy people getting an understanding of how things work at a lower level that... Uh, most people are very secretive about huh. and we've been very lucky and I've been very lucky to work at a company that's willing to to open up what it knows uh, about hardware and firmware. It's refreshing what you guys are doing and uh, I, I have to say that when I told uh, everybody in the Linux for Everyone Telegram group that I was jumping on this call tonight there were a lot of people who were like, please tell him that, you know, we all love their work and we're so grateful that they're doing what they're doing. And so I'm just passing that on, even though I, I get a sense that you guys know this already. Um, yeah, I definitely. I just wanted you to, I just wanted you to hear it that, you know, there are so many people who are, even if they're not using pop OS, mm -hmm. appreciate what you guys are bringing to the community. I really appreciate that. Uh, and, and it makes me nervous too. To see so much growth and see so <laughs> no many pressure, people using right. it, yeah, um, <laughs> it does. Things do go wrong from time to time, but they don't go wrong nearly as much as they used to. That's another really good thing. I, I'm getting ready to retire. Okay, I want to be at System Seventy Six for maybe another ten to twenty years and retire. I don't want to have to work in the other engineering environments uh, where people are sworn to secrecy where they're uh, given golden handcuffs at companies like Facebook <laughs> or we're Apple. Well, I, I well, really don't I, like that. I guess, you know, pulling back the curtain and, and sharing the secrets as it were is not necessarily hurting your business. It isn't. Hopefully other people can take a cue. Yes. They need to take note. We want our yeah. competitors to be more open and we want ourselves to be more open. And every step uh, we take is a step in that direction. Dude absolute pleasure talking to you tonight oh yeah man. you too jason it's been so it's been so much fun we should do it again though definitely do it again so any any like personal links or you know social media destinations that you want to share um maybe the preferred way for people to get in touch directly with you if they if they want to talk about uh contributing to to pop os or just chatting about nerdy stuff i think i prefer twitter Okay. So twitter.com slash J-E-R-E-M-Y underscore S-O-L-L-E-R. If you don't like Twitter, then um, you can email me directly. You can probably find my email. It's very, very easy. It is my first name at system76.com. Almost easier than going to Twitter. Safer too. Well, dude, I hope we, I hope we talk soon. And uh, until then, take care of yourself and uh, tell everybody over there at System76 that, you know, to keep kicking ass. I will definitely do that. Thank you, Jason. Awesome, dude. Yeah, you bet. Before I say goodbye this week, uh, I've got to talk to you guys about one more little rabbit hole that it looks like I'm going down. And that is, well, I, I've got the server bug. And I suppose it was inevitable, right? It's only a matter of time. I've been I've been testing laptops, honing my Pop! OS installation to perfection, uh, I, I love the Dracula theme, and I've just been theming everything. Uh, I capture B-roll all the time. I'm producing audio and video content across multiple systems. You know, I'm testing distros. I'm experimenting with new uh, software, like new video editors. And I desperately need some automation, some stability, some peace of mind. And because I'm me... I, I know that not only can I learn something new, but I can hopefully turn that into content and maybe turn it into something that helps other people. And so I think it's time to learn how to spin up and manage a home server, or maybe two of them or three of them. Um, so I've got the hardware. I have a System76 Thaleo, uh, and my friend Sky from our Discord group, he's going to be walking me through kind of the, the the basics, like, you know, helping me uh, establish a foundation, uh, a little bit of a, a learning set, and, and kind of know how to approach this whole process. Uh, but anyway, so he said, hey, go out and get a couple 
250 gig SSDs and then go out and get a couple, you know, two terabyte uh, standard hard drives and we're going to get some raid action going. But aside from the hardware aspect of it, I've been wondering, you know, what could I do with a home server? And there's so many options. I can't believe there's so many options. I could set up a Steam caching server, which would be super useful because I'm always benchmarking games and uh, and I, I plan to do more of that in the future, especially now that I've got the Tuxedo Computers backing. Uh, you know, I've got their financial support, and so now I have more time to do things like that. And anyway, a Steam caching server is great because you don't have to constantly re-download all of those games that you use for testing across various uh, systems. And one thing that I'm I'm pretty adamant about starting is a Music for Everyone server. And let me explain. There is a decentralized audio platform called Funk Whale. And I don't know, it reminds me like of uh, the Internet's version of Pirate Radio, maybe. Uh, it lets you upload music and create playlists and uh, it also allows other people to do the same in a shared instance. And so that has a lot of possibilities because I'm always wanting to share music and um, Paul, who writes the Music for Everyone feature in the newsletter, has great taste. And I know my friend Jerry Morrison is always wanting to... Sh- so there's there's uh, some tantalizing uh, possibilities there. Obviously, I can use it to back up and sync all of the things, automate some things. I have uh, my friends Dustin, uh, who works at Ubuntu Budgie, and Avery Roth, who is a PowerShell on Linux master, and by the way, there's an interview coming up with him as well, they are writing some scripts and some software using uh, Ansible and PowerShell, respectively, to help with a lot of that automation. You know, for example, let's say I get a new system in from Tuxedo, and I want to test it as a gaming device. Uh, so I can I can basically maybe maybe have all of this stuff on a server here at home, and hit a few triggers, right? Hit a few switches that trigger things. So I can say, okay, this is a gaming device. Automatically make it look like this and install these updates and install this software and then install Pharonix Test Suite and install these benchmarks and download Steam, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I can have kind of this uh, uniform environment no matter which system I'm testing, and it and it saves me a lot of time. So that's the end goal there. Now, I don't have a lot of knowledge in the server space. I have none, if I'm being honest. But I've always liked learning by doing. And when you have a community like this one, like the Linux for Everyone community, uh, there, there always seems to be help around every turn. So I'm going to try to update you guys every once in a while on my progress and what uh, what I'm doing. And if uh, we do any of that out in the open, like on GitHub, then I'll, I'll certainly share that. And if you have any suggestions on cool uh, server projects that are either useful for the community, maybe the community can get something beneficial out of it, or if it's just a, a fun project to, you know, a, an educational project to learn how to set up and manage a server, uh, give me a shout. Let me know. Linux for everyone at pm.me, which is also the email address you want to send your questions for episode 50's AMA. All right, I'm going to get out of here before you get sick of me and before I lose my voice. Uh, So thank you so much for listening. And until we chat again, you guys take care and take care of each other. Bye.